Hi guys, great to be here. Um, as I was just saying to Natasha, I think everything's uh, gone brilliantly. First for me, um, doing this kind of thing, and I'm sure it is for you. So um, my name's Miles. I'm from a company called Movement. As Natasha mentioned earlier on, we think vowels are a little bit uh, overrated. And uh, welcome to The Shed. Um, we're in North London here. Um, this has been known as The Shed of Hope at several times over the last few months. Um, but also the uh, Shed of Doom at one or two times too. Um, so yeah, welcome from Movement. Our um, strapline is that we help organizations look after the people they've already got and be more attractive to those that they want. Um, we do inclusion strategies, we help with diversity, uh, employee experience, EVP, and also employer brand. And we're also fascinated by culture. And when I was putting this together today, um, I was thinking, has there been any other period, certainly probably not in my lifetime, um, or one single event that has potentially affected culture as much as this had? Um, and, you know, a lot of organizations in the past uh, will have looked at themselves and thought, we've got a great culture here. Um, but I think that might have changed a little bit over the last few months. On the flip side, those organizations that perhaps didn't have such a great culture uh, might be seeing this as an opportunity to hit reset and to start again. Um, so, yeah, with, with, with every bit of adversity sometimes can come some opportunity. And every great Zoom call should have a quiz, so we'll be asking for your participation at some point. Um, over the next uh, sort of 15 minutes as well. Um, but yeah, let's start with, with a little bit about culture just before we do that. Um, Wikipedia offers this definition, and if I was to put up 10 different definitions and do it on a poll, I think we'd probably get quite a lot of uh, different answers for it. This isn't a bad definition at all. <clears throat> a couple of things that I really like in here, uh, values and behaviors, of course, um, very, very important to culture, but also the word unique. Um, every culture will be different, even though you will have some, some similarities. But for me, culture affects everything about a business. It affects productivity, it affects creativity, um, and of course, the reason why you're here today, inclusion and diversity as well. So just to have a look at the influence of culture, which uh, maybe I could have called the um, circle line of culture, looking at, uh, at this graph um, or this uh, slide. Um, but yeah, if your culture is lacking a little bit, if you haven't got the culture that you're looking for, you're gonna really, really struggle um, with regards to your inclusion. And if you haven't got in great inclusion, um, you're certainly not gonna have belonging. And um, if you do manage to attract a diverse candidate base to your organization, um, if you haven't got belonging, unfortunately, they're not going to stay. And that will again affect your culture and that will affect and so on and so on. So it's a virtuous circle if you get your culture right at the beginning in order to be able to take you through um, to inclusion and the, the ultimate aim, which, of course, <clears throat> is belonging. Now, we've only got so much time, so I'm not going to um, continue this introduction too long. Um, but I just want to share with you these culture components. And as we go through uh, the next few slides and we, we look at some research um, that we've done into, into culture, um, you're going to see some, some uh, reoccurring themes. And we believe that these four components here are absolutely key when it comes to, to working culture in an organization. And that's the working environment, how safe that you feel um, vulnerability, and we'll explain a little bit more about that um, with regards to a vulnerability loop, and the ultimate goal uh, that you could have in any organization is, is shared purpose. And all of these things together, um, if you get them right, will enable you to uh, increase your belonging in the organization. So um, the purpose of, of, of most of this presentation is some research that we did. And um, we were reading an article last spring and um, the article said that many leaders in the UK consider culture just a nice to have. And um, we thought that can't be right when there's so much at stake. So we decided to do some research and we put uh, something out there. We called it, are you in the culture club? Those near my age will understand uh, about that one. And um, we initially got 200 responses from, from leaders up and down the country, organizations of varying size. Um, and some of these we did face to face, some by type form, um, some over the phone. And we opened this up again um, in the spring to see whether we could put a bit of a slant on what we're all feeling and what we're finding um, with COVID. And perhaps look at some of those challenges 
and see how we can turn them into opportunities. Um, so we're going to get on with, with, with some of these um, now. And um, Natasha, I'd like to do a poll if I could on the first one, please. Of course. Is it that who's responsible? Uh, it is, yes, exactly that yeah. one. Okay, so it should be up on your screens now, everyone. Can you see it as well, Miles? Yeah, I can see it here. Uh, I've got it on a slide, but um, yeah, we've got it here. So, so the first question that we asked to to our, our leaders was, who is responsible for driving culture at your organisation? And we'd like to get your views on 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 how you feel this is mm -hmm. this should be answered. Um, option A is senior management leaders. It has to be fed from above. Option B is HR. They're closer to the people. And option C is our employees, it comes from below. So if you'd like to put your votes in now and we'll see how you do. <clears throat> I'll have a drink from my festival cup, which is as close as I'm gonna to get to one, unfortunately, this year. <laughs> I'll leave it just um, another 20 seconds or so. We've got a decent amount already, but I'll, um, I'll, I'll leave it just a little bit longer so we can get a few more votes. Normally you can see a lot of faces looking back up at you saying that uh, we voted. I know, I know. It's very strange to not have an audience um, and be able to sort of understand and also repeating um, what I've been saying throughout the day. So, okay, I think <laughs> we might be, might be good. So I'm going to end the polling now and I'll just launch the results. So you should also be able to see the results there. Okay, great. Wow, this is this is uh, going to be a, a first, I think, and this is the bit, of course, that you can't rehearse. So we've had sixty-five percent say senior management leaders; it had to be fed from above. Ten percent say HR, and twenty-five percent say uh, our employees. It comes from below. Um, so I'm going to close that off now. And would you believe, unrehearsed, um, that the answer that we've got here? Uh, from our 300 leaders is exactly the same. 65% of the 300 people that we polled, I haven't managed to, to switch slides very, very quickly, uh, felt that culture should be controlled from above. Um, now, fine, it's a, it's a decent answer, but um, we will beg to differ slightly. Um, if you really want to get shared purpose going in your organisation, we think that culture can't be dictated from above. Um, we think that it's it's possible to um, influence, but it shouldn't be dictated. So it should come from the beating heart of your organisation, um, your people. Um, working environment, of course, we've had a massive, massive change in our working environments, all of us. And the thought is that are your um, employees at the moment out of sight, um, but are they out of mind? Um, are your people feeling included? Um, so a lot of reassurance is going to be needed and also from the safety aspect um, a lot of candidates a lot of candidates sorry a lot of employees won't be feeling secure a lot of people in your team might be um, worried about job security and that kind of thing at the moment so perhaps they're going to need some of that that reassurance to to just um, let them know that everything's going to be okay and to let them know what's going on in the in the organization at the moment so we're going to move on to another question. We're not going to do a poll on this one. Um, but the next question that we asked was, our senior management team is representative of the communities that exist within our organisation. And this time we asked our leaders to strongly agree to strongly disagree. So to choose uh, one to five on that. And I'll let you digest the question just for a second. So our senior management team is representative of the communities that exist. And this was the answer we got uh, only 17 percent of our leaders uh, thought that their management team was representative of the the, the people that they've got in their in their organization um so yeah this was a bit of a wow for us um now look i mean with regards to diversity we've made huge strides over over the last few years but it just shows that there is still a long way to go um nothing I think makes people feel less safe or less wanting to apply for a job than if there isn't somebody like them that they can relate to some kind of role model in the organization and especially at senior management as well. Um, I heard Dan mention this earlier on when he was doing his talk but one thing that we always say to to all the, 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 the people that we, we partner with is to, to work out who your communities in the organization are um, before you embark on any inclusion or diversity strategy. And it's not just the, the visible communities, um, the, 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 the ones that you'd expect, it's those hidden communities as well, the, 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 the ones that you, you can't see. 
And with COVID and with everything that's happened, a hell of a lot of new communities will have been forming. Um, lots of new groups will have been, been coming together that, that people will identify themselves with. So for example, um, people with kids, uh, people who are, are having to be teacher at the same time as trying to do their job. Um, people who haven't got kids, who are sick of people who have got kids banging on about how difficult it is at the moment. Uh, those have got, who've got no outdoor space, nowhere to go, um, high risk health as well. So um, yeah, it's really going to affect people's safety if they feel that they're, they're part of these groups and uh, there isn't anybody that they, they can identify with on, um, in senior management. One wonderful thing you can do, and this is the first time we're mentioning this and we'll mention it as we go on, is, is show a little bit of vulnerability as a leader or vulnerability to your team. And um, we love a thing called the vulnerability loop, which means that when you open up a little bit about yourself, it encourages those in your team to open up a little bit about themselves and you share your experiences. So, you know, my kids, oh my God, they've been coming in every five minutes today. Not everybody's as fortunate as me having a shed to escape to. The door's been flinging open. Yeah, me too. It's been the same. So sharing those experiences enables you to communicate um, in, a, in a slightly different way. So we're going to move on to the next one and this time we asked um, if a member of staff oh sorry if you asked a member of staff about your company objectives for the coming year would they a know mostly what you're looking to achieve b have a rough idea what they what they are or c have absolutely no idea um, what you're talking about so i'll just let you digest that question just for a second a b or c we asked our leaders and the answers we got, 52% of leaders said that people would know mostly what they're talking about. So good news? Hmm, perhaps not, because um, nearly half of uh, employees um, they thought wouldn't know what they were talking about. So yeah, it's, it, it's okay when you've got everybody in a room together with you in the same working environment. Um, but yeah, how, how are things at the moment when people are balancing a laptop on their knee in their bedroom or working from the kitchen table? How are you communicating um, with your people with, with regards to, to the objectives of your company? Um, and we're in, a, we're in a new age here. It's, it's, a, it's a new beginning that we've got. And we've said before that um, mission, purpose and values very often are put together by leadership and stuck up on a wall and uh, they mean absolutely nothing to, to people in an organization so maybe you've got an opportunity to do something radical like rip up your mission purpose and values and put some new ones together with the people or your people at the heart of that strategy involving them in what it's really like to work there and what their values are and um, because they should be your company values and then we're back to vulnerability again on on things that you can do at the moment um, Everybody loves to be told that they're valued and a really nice way to tell people that you're valued is, is to say, look, we've got a really, really special team here, but I need your help. I can't do this without you. Um, I need you to contribute to, to, to what we're doing here. We're all in this together. And um, again, people will open up and they will understand what the objectives, what your immediate objectives are potentially to get through the, the difficult period that we're in at the moment. So I think it's time to get you guys involved again. Guys, I said that word. I said I wasn't going to say it today. You, uh, people, lovely people, friends involved today, um, if we can. So Natasha, hopefully we've got another slide question. Of course. It's tricky, isn't it? I, um, I, I think I must say guys a lot of the time. Um, no. I will make a conscious effort to not, but you should all have the poll in front of you now. Thank you. So, so this time we're, we're not going to ask you um, to answer the question. We're going to do a little bit of family fortunes. Um, what did our survey say? We asked 300 leaders um, and we just made this statement. There is a sense of belonging in, our, in my organisation. And we'd like you to, to try and second guess um, what our leaders said. So did 37% strongly agree or agree there's a sense of belonging? Did 52% strongly agree or agree there's a sense of belonging? Or did 65% strongly agree or agree there's a sense of belonging? So we'll let you, uh, let you vote on that and try and, you got it spot on last time. Um, so we'll see uh, this time whether you're, you're in sync. Just do a little 
song and dance in the meantime, Miles. <laughs> no. I I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'll tell a gag, but uh, you can't, if you can't see your audience, it's... Uh... Okay, I'm going to end the polling now and I'll launch the results for you as well. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, we had 28% uh, said 37% would strongly agree or agree. Uh, the winner there for, for you guys was 52%, about half, and uh, a little bit less for 65%. Um, so the actual number was 37%. So 37% of leaders thought there was a sense of belonging in their organization. Um, which unfortunately means that 63% felt that there wasn't a sense of belonging. Um, so, yeah, look, uh, this sense of belonging, as we've heard from, from other speakers today, is, is what everybody, what every organisation, I'm sure, is, is looking to achieve. It's, it affects every, every business metric. And um, I think one thing that we've got to remember is that not everybody is having the same experience at the moment. There are lots and lots of different experiences with regards to working environment. And <clears throat> we've done quite a lot of talking about, um, you know, how people are enjoying working from home at the moment. We also know there's a lot of people out there who really aren't enjoying this and can't wait to get back into the office just because they're not as, as privileged as me as having somewhere to escape to to work. So are we still together whilst we're still apart i guess is the big question there and then back to, to to safety and back to belonging um it's the ultimate goal um diversity without inclusion and belonging for us is just ticking boxes belonging is is feeling like you've got a voice and also been listening to you can have an organization full of different people um, but if you haven't got different opinions um for us it's it's fairly pointless and as has been mentioned today as well and probably not something to go into too, too deeply now um this week has shown us um you know we can see what happens i think when society um, or when belonging in society is lacking a little bit and when people feel like that they haven't got a voice and that they they're not getting listened to um, so i'm going to move on to my last piece of insight now and this was a statement that we put to our leaders, uh, which was that my people understand what is expected of them. And we asked them to strongly agree, to strongly or to strongly disagree, uh, number one to five again. Uh, maybe you're guessing um, what the stat is that I'm gonna put up. And this time it is 50%. So 50% um, thought, thought that they're, people didn't know what was expected of them. So 50% of people were saying here really don't know maybe what they should be doing. Um, and yeah, with regards to safety and the, these, these components of culture, um, there's a potentially, I guess, some pleasant cocktail at the moment um, with the worries that people are gonna have with regards to their job and their loved ones. Um, mental health is, is being hugely affected. And if you're not sure what you're supposed to be doing in your job as well, that's gonna make things really, really difficult. So um, yeah, with regards to this shared purpose and, and, and vulnerability, ask people for help. If you ask them for help, it's going to make it incredibly clear um, what's expected of them and, and how they can, they can help and assist you um, in, in your role. So I'm just going to move into the last couple of slides and just to wrap up again, these, these, these culture components. Um, hopefully you've seen here a little bit how culture, belonging, inclusion um, go hand in hand and may help you lead to, to a more um, diverse audience. Um, and remember all of these four components um, if you can. And the, the ultimate aim, of course, is to get belonging in your organization. And each of these four things hopefully will, will enable you to, to do that. <clears throat> I'm just gonna go on to a, a sort of last summary slide. Um, when, when you registered for this conference, I'm sure you put down what you're interested in today. Um, and one of the things that I think uh, that certainly I saw, and I saw this last year, when we made our, our sort of debut as an organization uh, was that how, how can we get a more diverse candidate pool um, or more diverse talent pool? And um, yeah, I think it, it starts with your culture. If you can get your culture right, it will help you with inclusion. It will help you with belonging. You are going to be able to tell stories about how great your organization is. 
and that in turn will attract a more diverse um, candidate pool. And you might say that we might not have diversity in the first place, but if you're honest about who you are um, and you're authentic about what you want to achieve, um, people will want to come along for the ride. It's fine to be aspirational and say, we're not that good at this at the moment, but, but we're gonna change, we want to do this. And ask your people for help. Show that little bit of vulnerability and they'll, they'll want to help. And the final thing I think is that um, I'm hearing lots of people talk about new normal. We're, we're not doing new normal uh, movement. We want to talk about new beginnings. Um, there's a wonderful opportunity right now for organizations to hit the reset button on whatever strategies they've got, whether it be culture, whether it be inclusion or, or some other strategy, hit the reset button and, and, and start again and um, trying to work towards some positive change by, by using their people as the inspiration to, to take them forward um, in some size, shape or form. Um, so yeah, that's what I've got for you thus far. Amazing, thank you very much, Miles. Um, I, do, I love that pineapple. Do you know why as well? And this is going to be something very random. And I'm sure everyone that's listening has been like, why are you talking about this? My sister's cat is called Piña, <laughs> which is pineapple in Spanish. I think it's because she likes oh, okay. pineapple drinks on holiday when she's in Spain. Um, but I've just got this affinity to pineapples now, which is slightly weird. But um, there you go. Uh, Miles, great session. Thank you very much for, uh, for sharing your insights and also some of the, the results as well. Um, and I, I'm not sure if I missed it at the beginning. Did you, um, who, who were the um, survey respondents that you had? Yeah, there were, there were organisations. So we, we put it out in a variety of places um, on LinkedIn, um, okay. talked to, to clients that we'd had and, and other people. Um, and yeah, we, we, we sent out a type form and asked them to respond. So lots of different organisations, Natasha, um, verging from 50 people up to thousands of people. Um, mm -hmm. But there were, there were senior leaderships and chief executives um, yeah. of, those, of those orgs. Amazing. And um, one of the questions that we've had come through uh, was, were there any significant differences between sectors in terms of the types of response given? Um, did you see any sort of real changes in... Uh, in, in uh, we didn't, to be honest with you. It wasn't something that we profiled it on, so I won't try and say yes, we did or, or no, we didn't. It wasn't something that we looked at by, by individual sector. I'm sure if, um, if these guys want to visit you on the um, on the stand, it might be um, something that you can look into just to get. We can do, yeah, that. we absolutely can do. We've got we've got got all of the respondents there, so we yeah we could definitely look into it. I've given you a job there, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Leo. Hopefully, the team now going to be going. Ah, oh, what have you done? I know. Apologies to the team, uh, Leo. Hopefully that answers your um, question, or at least you'll get the answer. Um, another question that we've had is: Do you think leaders within organisations are Oblighted by the importance of belonging because of the other pressures that they have, such as the profit, um, and as a result, they forget about the value of the, the people in their workforce. Do you think it's just a, a time issue for people in, in that leadership role? Yeah, I, th I think it is. I mean, one thing that we, we very often say to people that, that if you're going to put a strategy together, you have to give it the same focus that you would um, with regards to everything else that you do in your business. Um, but uh, as I think Dan said before as well, you know, for, for us, any decent strategy should begin with your people because of the benefits that you're going to get after that, because you're going to get more creativity, because you're going to get more productivity. If you get this shared purpose working together, it will ultimately aim you or ultimately get you more profit. So people do talk about the, 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 the bottom line, but yeah, it starts, starts with the people who are in the organization mm -hmm. and it will feed through eventually. Yeah, excellent. Um, and before we, we go on to the very final question that we've had to come through, um, if every, if for everyone that's still um, still online and just listened to, to that session, if you could go onto slido.com on your phone or another browser to provide a little bit of feedback uh, for Miles' session, that'd be really helpful. Just gives us a little bit of guidance um, on, on sort of where to go in the future in different topics as well. So if you could do that for me whilst you're still listening, uh, that'd be wonderful. But the last question I have, um, for you, Miles, was um, it was actually a question that got asked earlier, and I've just reopened it. Mm. How do you ensure that hiring or promoting staff for diversity reasons isn't just a tick box exercise? And this is it's, it's not a small question, but how do you make it ingrained into your company culture of uh, diversity rather than it just being a tick box? Yeah, I think I, th I think we said before that that you know if if 
yeah, the, if you're if you're just concentrating on diversity, it is just ticking boxes. It's it's more on the inclusion. So you know, are, are, are you promoting people? Um, are they going to become role models to to others there in the organisation? Are they going to have a voice in the shaping of the organisation? And are you going to listen to that voice? It's about having those different opinions. So there's no point uh, employing a diverse work, workforce or promoting people into into certain positions if then you don't hear their opinion and their influence on everything that goes on in the organization because as we know differing opinions lead to so many wonderful things there's so many stories of of um products that until they got opinions of a, a of a, a diverse group of people weren't um suited to one particular group or another so it's incredibly important i think that that you're not just ticking that box that you then um have th that that understanding of of what these people will bring and all these differing opinions that that are, are coming into an organization and, and use use those voices